All right, it's about time to, uh, to get back in. If we can uh, wave at, uh, Colin, can you wave at those in the uh, hallway that we want to get started? We're trying to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time as possible. And um, one of the things I do appreciate about our church, we have to stop doing church so we can do church. I mean, people like talking with one another. They like, they like visiting together. And that's good. That's, that's called being the church. And, uh, and we want that. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's yelling. All right, here they come. All right. I want to also just uh, want to appreciate Pastor Lloyd. Thank you for being with us this evening. I know most of us here at uh, at CCC we love spending our Thanksgivings with uh, New Perfect Peace, which is now Calvary Calvary Bible Church. You guys are merged, and that's that's uh, that's going together. And now Pastor Lloyd is uh, is the pastor there, not just a co-pastor there. So thank you, brother, for being with us. Also, I just want to say, um, you know, one of the things that Mike did when we, Karen and I came to his church, and I was a coach and school teacher, and we got involved there and got involved in the discipleship, and he began to then put us in front of other teachers, and that was always a great thing, and one of them was a guy named Max Barnett. He was a student, Baptist Student Union director, Oklahoma University. You were there 35 years, 37 and a half years. 37 and a half years. Some of you know we've had Max and Sandra at our Flame Conference. I think, they, I think you guys did the first Flame Conference for us, or first or second Flame Conference. And, uh, and so they had a, just a, a wonderful ministry there. But one of the things I noticed about Max, I thought, man, that guy's intense. <laughs> I mean, he is on go. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, then, he, then he's, he's got a great autobiography out there. I'd encourage you to get that and read that. And as I read that, I'm going, I had no idea how intense he was. <laughs> because he's been intense most of his life, I believe. God has got a special hand and has had his hand on Max Barnett and his wife, Sandra. And you'll hear from, from them tomorrow as well. But uh, I just want to ask him to come. He's going to talk about the essential of evangelism. I've heard him tell so many stories about God using people them and others to bring people into faith with Christ, into the kingdom. And so, Max, I'm going to ask you to come. Let me pray for you and then come on up. Father, again, thank you for our time. ask that you would bless Max. Thank you for his work. Thank you, Father, for his investment into so many lives, including our own. And I just pray right now that you will speak through him. And again, may your Holy Spirit take these words and drive them deeper into our hearts. May our lives be changed because of it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Max. The way I started in evangelism was I was at Texas A&M, and uh, I am an Aggie. And uh, one night I was praying, and... uh, I had come to know the Lord, I think, when I was seven or eight, but uh, in a little Baptist church. But like so many of you, no one really helped me to grow. And we'd go to church some, and then we moved shortly thereafter. I remember when I made a decision, I was standing in church, and a buddy of mine was standing there, and I was really under conviction, knowing I needed to accept the Lord. And when the pastor gave the invitation, he said, I'm going. And I said, I'm going too. So we went down to the front, and Mom didn't want me to be baptized because she was afraid I just went down the aisle because my buddy did. But that wasn't true. I knew something had happened to me. And I remember that afternoon, we went driving out in the country, and I've since read this. Other people said it, but I remember very clearly that day thinking, 
I don't think the sky has ever been so blue or the grass has ever been so green. There's just a sense that something had happened. But then I, we moved from there. I wasn't baptized. And when I was about 14, I was studying in church. And I think, you know, I'm not a Christian. So I go down the aisle and make another decision. And I think, I wish somebody had come into youth group and said, uh, how many of you are Christian? Because I wanted to raise my hand. I thought, I am a Christian. But then I didn't grow. And I got to Texas A&M. And one night, a group of us was talking. And they said, hey, there's a boy down the hall that uh, claims to be uh, an agnostic and said, why don't we go get him, get him in on a discussion? Well, he came in that night and claimed either he was either an agnostic or an atheist. I don't know which, but he turned me every way but loose that night, you know, about what I believed and what I'd been taught. And I remember walking out on the drill field that night and I said, Lord, I don't know if I became a Christian when I was seven or when I was 14 but if I'm not a Christian, I want to be one tonight. And nothing seemed to happen. So the next day I prayed again. said, now, Lord, if I didn't mean it when I was seven or was 14 or last night, I mean it today. And nothing seemed to happen. So the next day I said, now, God, remember, if I didn't mean it when I was seven or 14 or yesterday or the day before, I mean it today. But I didn't have any assurance. And so there's a Gideon Bible in my room, and I began to read it. And I, as I began to read that over a period of time, the doubts left. And when I grew up in high school on Saturday nights, you just went to the movies. So when I went to Texas A&M, I'd walk over to the movie. And I remember one Saturday night, I was walking over to go to the movies, and I stopped under a tree, and I thought, you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time reading the Bible this week. It'd probably be good if instead of going to the movie, I just went back to my room and read the Bible. And I can remember him standing under that tree and struggling with what to do. And I finally decided, I'm going to go back to my room and read the Bible. If you had walked into that room two hours after that decision, you would have found one happy Aggie. And I began to read the Bible. <clears throat> and I began to pray. And I started going to the Baptist Student Union. And uh, I'd go to church, and one night I was praying, Lord, I want to be the man you want me to be. And so I began to pray. I'd planned to be a veterinarian. I said, Lord, when I get my veterinary hospital, I'm going to try to make enough money, and I'll personally send a missionary. And I thought God would really be excited about that. <laughs> and so I kept telling God what I was going to do when I got out of school, and and God spoke to me. Just, it wasn't a voice, but as he often does, just a real impression in your mind. I want you to be a witness here now. And man, that scared me. And I couldn't get God to move off of that idea. And I thought, well, I need to be obedient. So I had a little New Testament that somebody had given me as a boy uh, in Sunday school. And I brought that to college. So I stuck it in my pocket. And I started down the hall. And I was going to witness to somebody. And I was scared to death. And I walked by. And we didn't have air conditioning then. And I saw this boy <clears throat> sitting there uh, studying. And his door was open. And I thought, I need to witness to him. But I was scared. So I walked on down there in the hall. And I read the bulletin board. And then I prayed. And I walked by. And I looked at him again. And then I went down there in the hall. And I got a drink. And then I read the bulletin board, and I got another drink. And I don't know how many times I walked up and down before I finally knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm an Aggie like you are, but I want to tell you what Jesus means to me. So that was the beginning for me. I didn't know much about it. And one night, a fellow next door came in, and he said, you know, he went to the Baptist Student Union with me. He said, you know, I've never led anybody to the Lord. I said, you haven't, just like I was an old pro at it or something. <laughs> I said, do you want to? And he said, yeah. And I said, I do too. So why don't we go witness every night till somebody becomes a Christian? And let's start tonight. And he said, well, I got a paper due tomorrow. And I said, well, I got a test, but it won't take long. I mean, the dorms are full of guys. 
And so we started going, and we went every night till somebody became a Christian. And we began to witness. <clears throat> and uh, so over a period of time, we decided every night at 10 o'clock, you can study till 10, but at 10 o'clock, it's time to go witness. And so night after night, we would do that. Well, over a period of, for a period of about a year and a half, we saw two people a week except the Lord as other groups joined us, and we began to see God really do some things. And we began, <clears throat> on weekends, I'd get together with some guys, we'd study the Bible, we'd pray. We began to get invitations to go to other campuses and lead witnessing clinics because they'd heard what had happened at A&M. And so we were gone, <clears throat> a lot of weekends, I'd go to Baylor, I'd go here and there, and, and lead witnessing clinics. Well, I didn't know a lot about it, but I just knew you ought to do it. And I'd tell them, you go, let's go do it. I'll go with you. And so then as we began to pray, we had a retreat, and we felt like two guys ought to drop out of school for a year and just travel to college campuses and help people witness. And as we met that weekend, as we prayed, state director was there, our local director. This wasn't some harebrained idea of just some college students. If we prayed, we really felt like two students should go because we were getting more invitations to go to college campuses than, than we could take and stay in school. So <clears throat> I felt like God wanted me to drop out of school, and so I called my parents, and of course the thing they were afraid of is I'd not finish school. And I said, no, I promise I want to drop out. Started that fall semester, and we dropped out. I'll... I'll come back and finish college, but I feel like this is what God wants me to do. Another fellow felt the same, so a man in Houston provided us a used car, and we started traveling. We'd go to campus. We'd be there three to five days usually, and we'd get up and speak to the students about witnessing and say, if you want to go, we'll go with you. Everywhere we went, we saw students come to Christ. God worked in, in ways that was unbelievable. And uh, right in the spring of that year, right before school was out, we were in Richmond, Virginia, visiting, uh, leading some witnessing clinics on campuses. And I had the flu that week, and so stayed in bed. And most of the time, when I was awake, I just prayed, God, we got another week or two before some of the campuses are out. Would you really lead us? We got this call from a girl in Moorhead, Kentucky. She said, I feel like God wants to do something on the campus. Would you come? My roommate answered the phone and said, no, Max is sick. We're due to be on another campus. We can't come. Well, <clears throat> I continued to pray, and a day or two later, she called back and said, I really would love for you to come. I've heard what God's done on some of the campuses where you've been. So I said to Skip, <clears throat> The guy that was with me, I said, why don't we split up and I'll go to Moorhead and you go to the other campus for a follow-up visit where we were going back. And so I, I got to Moorhead on a Friday night. And so uh, I met with a group, of, or on a Saturday, I met with a group of students and they were, most of them had been Christians for a very short time. And there were just five or six of them in this little BSU. So we talked about witnessing and the next day being Sunday, we didn't have anything so they could go to church. We met back on Monday night. That invited some of their friends and started inviting people, and we had about 15 people there. And so I, I could see they were scared to death to witness. I said, I tell you what, guys, why don't you do this? Go over to the men's dorm. This was a state campus. There were two men's dorms, two women's dorms. I said, you go to this one dorm, and go around and knock on all the doors, invite the guys to come down the lobby, and I'll come in, give a testimony, and uh, share the gospel, and you can see the ones are interested, and then follow them to the room and witness to them. And I thought that'd help break the ice. So we led our little witnessing clinic, and I went over at 10 o'clock that night. I could not believe what I saw. I walked in, that place was full of people. And I said to one of the guys, how'd you get all these guys here? He said, we went around the dorm. We knocked on every door and said, come down to the lobby. We're having a dorm meeting. 
I said, did you tell them the nature of the meeting? They said, no, we just told them to come down as a darn meeting. <laughs> now this was Monday night, finals were to start on Wednesday. They thought the dorm master had called a meeting and it's important that you be there because if you don't check out right, you don't get your grades. And so they thought the dorm master had a real important message for them and they had to come. Well, I don't think God likes to use deceptive methods. So I said, well, guys, if you're deceived in the reason you're here, you can leave right now. It won't hurt my feelings. But if you stay here for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you how I became a Christian. I'm going to tell you how you can become a Christian. Because, guys, before you leave, I want you to know this. If you don't become a Christian, you're going to mess up your life. And someday you're going to marry a girl and mess up her life. And you're going to have kids and mess up their lives. So if you want to leave, you can. But that's what we're going to talk about for the next 20 minutes. And they just sat there. I mean, nobody left. Not one single person. And so for the next 20 minutes, as clearly as I could, I mean, I preached to them about the gospel and shared it. And I said, now... <clears throat> If you're not interested in becoming a Christian, would you please leave so I can talk to those that are? And they just sat there. Nobody left. I said, now, if you're not interested in becoming a Christian, would you please leave? And nobody left. I said, well, let me go through this one more time to make sure you understand. So I again shared the message. And they wouldn't leave. And, and I finally said, well, guys, I turned to Romans 10, 13. It says, whosoever shall come to know the Lord will be saved. Okay? Whoever will believe will be saved. Okay? And so I, I, I just laid the Bible down the floor. And I said, now, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That whosoever means you. So come... If you want to be saved, come put you on your finger on that whosoever, because that means you. And they started coming. And pretty soon, you couldn't even get close to the Bible. I'd never seen anything like that. And God did an amazing work. So we were there till probably 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, just talking to guys, talking to individuals. The next day, I was supposed to have my little witnessing clinic on Tuesday night. And I'd said to one of the girls in the BSU that day, Ask the dorm mom if I can come speak in the girl's dorm. And she said, you don't know our dorm mother. There's no way she'll let you speak. I said, well, let me tell you, God is at work. You ask her. And I told the BSU director, I'm going up on a hill and spend the morning with the Lord. I've never seen God work like this, and I want to be ready for what he's doing. I never felt more unworthy in my life up on that mountain that day, just praying that God would do something. So that night, when I had my witnessing clinic, they were bringing in chairs. Pastors had heard what was happening in the community. There were people all over the place with a little witnessing clinic. And I said to one of the girls now, and she had asked a dorm mother if I could come speak. She said, we'd be glad to have him come speak. So I went over to the girl's dorm, and we were to meet at 9 o'clock. They didn't buy the girls from one dorm to come over to the other one. Now, here's Tuesday night, final starting the next morning. I walk in there at 9 o'clock. There are girls everywhere. They're sitting on the couch, on the floor. I began to speak. One girl just started crying. And then another girl, and another girl. I spoke very slowly, deliberately. I didn't want it to be some emotional meeting. And I finally said, if you're interested... And talking further about becoming a Christian, I want you to leave the dorm. They had to go down the stairs underneath. The director's was a girl of the BSU in her room. Her office was in the basement of the girl's dorm. There were girls out in the hall. They came in there. There's a couch. I had three to sit down on the couch. I deal with them. And around every, those kids, in, the girls in the BSU, there's little huddles as each one of them were talking to people, trying to, and that's what I'd wanted to happen, for them to begin to lead people to the Lord. I looked at my wife and said, oh, me, I've got to speak at the other men's dorm at 10 o'clock. So I rushed over there. I didn't know what I'd see. I walked in, and there again, 
it was full of people. There were chairs in the front, it was kind of a lounge chair, and there's one chair vacant in the whole room, people standing along the walls. And so I said, fellas, if you came to hear a great sermon, you came to the wrong place, I just want to tell you how you can know Jesus. And as I spoke, there was a doorway behind me, and a boy walked by as I was speaking, and he stopped in front of me and just looked at me for a moment, and went over and sat down in that chair. The strangest thing. And after a while, I paused. He stood up, walked up in front of me, and he said, listen, I'm an atheist. And he said, until tonight, I didn't even believe there was a God. And he said, I got here kind of late, and just what do you have to do to be saved? I said, you can be saved anywhere, anytime you're willing to turn your life over and ask Jesus Christ to become your Savior. And he said, I'd do anything. So we knelt and he began to pray. Asked Christ to come into his life. He stood up and he began to share. He said, guys, you all know what a dorm clown I've been, but I'm not clowning tonight. Why don't you come give your life to Jesus? And uh, I noticed one of the guys down on his knees, he happened to be the golf or tennis coach. And made my way to him. I just left the service in that boy's hand. He's doing a great job with it. And I don't know how many people came to know the Lord that night. I know the next morning there were many of the kids down by the river praying. I had the names of many of them. I prayed for them. And school was out. And God did a tremendous work. And I, I saw the value of what God can do with anybody that will yield themselves to the Lord and just share the message. And so I want to ask you some questions tonight. Why, what is, why are we so different than the early Christians we read about in the book of Acts? You already have met, read more books in, in your life than Peter ever read. Why are we so different than the early Christians? Why are we so reluctant to witness? You can walk up to a stranger and ask them what time it is, but you wouldn't dare walk up and ask them if they know Jesus. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that sometimes we build relationships and it's over a period of time and especially true with some people we work with and some people that are in our, maybe in our family. But Paul didn't move, go to Corinth and just sit down and start establishing deep personal relationships. He started witnessing the day he got there. And why are we so different than the early Christians? I want us to take a look at them for a few minutes. I want to take you to the book of Acts. <clears throat> And I want to share with you a little bit about their life and what they did. <clears throat> in, in, second, in, in Acts chapter 3, Peter preaches. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 1, now Peter and John were going to the temple, the ninth hour of prayer. And there's a lame man begging for alms. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I, I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Well, it's amazing what happened to this young man. And so as a result of it, it drew a lot of attention. And so the authorities didn't like what Peter and John had done. And so in Acts chapter 4, they brought them before the whole assembly the priests and the Sadducees, and they were greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So the, the leaders, the Sadducees, the priests, they didn't like what they were doing. And so they laid hands on them and they put them in jail and the next day, it was already evening, and then they bring them before the group. But notice what had happened. The, some of the people were against them, 
but many of those who heard the message believed. And that's always true. When we share the message, some people may not like it, but some people are going to believe. And that's exactly what happened with them. Now, in verse 7 of Acts chapter 4, when they placed them in the center, they began to inquire. By what power or in what name have you done this? And then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and said to him, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for the benefit that has been done to this sick man, we let it be known to you that in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom Jesus raised from the dead, by this man had been made whole. Now here they are, they're on trial for witnessing. So what do they do? They witness. And you see that again and again with them. And they say in, verse, in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, people, I don't know if you've ever given much thought. But as I, as I read this, and we're, we're going to look at other verses, I see that these people, they, were, they did not just have some beliefs. Like if I were to say to you, do you believe that every person when they die goes to either heaven or hell? Do you believe that? You believe that? Okay, but do you have a conviction about that? Or is it just something now you say you believe? Are you aware what it's like when a man goes to hell that is forever and ever? And in Luke 16, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain Rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores. And more of the dogs had come and licked his sores. And it says the beggar died and was carried by an angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. And in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torment. And he could see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And when he saw there was no hope for him, he said, send him to my father's house. I have five brothers. Let's say come to this place of torment. Now in life, all of us have probably at one time been sick or had an illness or something, but we always had hope that we'd get better. But do you know when a person goes to hell, it never gets any better, and he's there forever and ever and ever. And he's in torment, and he's separated from God who loved him and died for him and made salvation available to him. But you know, the Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but how will they call on him and whom they have not believed, and how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they going to hear without a preacher? And it doesn't mean a full-time preacher. It's just someone to preach the word, someone to share the word with them. You know, I think the early Christians were very different for us. We have beliefs. We believe in heaven and hell, but they had a conviction. They had a conviction that everybody they needed to know Jesus. And so they're willing to share that message. Now look, <clears throat> verse 17 of Acts chapter 4. But so that it will spread no further. Now, you know, back in a little earlier, they said, we cannot but speak the things we've heard, seen and heard. They said, we don't want you speaking. And they said, well, we, we can't keep from speaking what we've seen and heard. And then in verse 17 of chapter 4, but so that it spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in Jesus' name. So when they summoned them, verse 18, they commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter answered and said, Were this right in the sight of God to give heed 
to you or to God, you be the judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. They further threatened them, but the people <clears throat> responded because they were glorifying God for what happened. And so what did they do? They threatened them, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. So they go get together as a group of believers in verse 29, and they said, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. Now, isn't it interesting? They didn't get together and pray, oh, God, protect us. Give us safety. They prayed for boldness. And two verses later, it said they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke the word of God with boldness. And you see this again and again. How they'd, they'd catch them, threaten them, turn them loose, and here they'd go. Bring them on trial. We told, did not we straightly command you that you should not speak in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. So Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42 and what did they do? Well, it says they brought them together and they flogged them. They beat them. And they departed from the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now notice that rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame you know, it's amazing in this country. You know what every person, every student, every child needs to know more than anything else? They need to know about Jesus. They need to know Jesus. But the educational system says don't say anything about Jesus. The government in this country, don't say anything about Jesus. So what do we do? We don't say anything about Jesus. And you know, I notice some of you out there, you're, maybe you're retired or you're a little older. You know what the danger is? The older you get, you begin to coast. You know? Well, let's let the younger people do it. I've heard this in the church. We serve the Lord. Now let's, let's let them take the leadership. Well, I don't mind them taking some leadership, but that doesn't mean you need to be coasting. And there are people all about you. Every person you ever will meet, they're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And some of them would give anything in the world if you had talked to them. But no, we're afraid. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, The Lord's not given us a spirit of fear. See, you could go over to a neighbor, and if you need to borrow some sugar because you're making, you could do that. But have you ever gone over and just asked your neighbor about their relationship with Christ? You know, I hope you decide that during my lifetime, I'm going to give my life to witnessing. That's the first step for disciple making. You've got to start there. And I don't think I've ever known anyone that really got into disciple making, but, for, but what first they began to become a real witness. And so that's where you start. You start with evangelism. Now, we can talk about some methods, but methods to put methods or put tools in people's hands or hearts are not ready to use really doesn't help. How many people, how many of you have been some, through some kind of, of training in evangelism, but who have you witnessed to this week? And there are people all about us that need to know Jesus. Now let me just <clears throat> suggest you do something. Learn to ask, smile and ask questions. And, you know, you go some. I have a buddy. He says, you know, I try to, we were in Texas A&M together, and, and one of the guys I helped, helped him, and, and he really got a vision for disciple making. And he said, I try to give out a thousand tracts a year. That's on an average of three a day. 
And he said, I found ways to witness. He said, I go to Walmart, and my wife wants me to go pick up a certain thing, so I'll just, I may could find it by myself, but I don't. He said, I'll find one of the people that works at Walmart, and I say, now, where's so-and-so? And a lot of times they say, well, it's over here. Or, and now, where? Well, let me just walk you over there. And that's exactly what he wants. He gets over there, and he begins to ask him, could I ask you a question? If you were to die tonight, do you know your, where, where you would go? Well, I hope I... I hope I'd go to heaven. Well, would you like to know for sure? And that's his way of sharing the gospel. And I talked to him uh, late, earlier in the week, and he's leading people to the Lord all, all, all the time. He's also a disciple maker. He's following up with them. He's got a number of people that he's meeting with. And that's the way he does it. And, you know, I've just found, you can ask someone, it's so easy to begin to ask someone, like I find with a waitress, and I can ask her, do you live, do you live here? Or I go somewhere, we have a plumber, comes in and I ask him, do you live here in Norman? Well, I live up in Moore. How long have you lived here? Well, I've lived here about five years. Well, could I ask you something? You've lived here for five years. Have you found a good church? And usually, if I approach the thing, a church with a lot of them, I say, well, now I don't go. Or, <clears throat> week, <clears throat> not this week, but the week before, I had to go get a tire fixed. And so I'm waiting for them to fix my tire. And I notice another guy over there, he's waiting. He walks out of the building. He's over there by his pickup smoking. And so I walk over to him. I begin to talk with him. You waiting to get fixed? Yeah, I'm waiting to tire. I said, let me ask you, you live around here? Oh, yeah, I've lived here for many, many years. Let me ask you, if you found a good church here? And he said, well, I used to go, but he said, I don't go now. And he said, since I don't walk the walk, I don't do the talk. And he just sounded like he was very proud of that. And so I began to talk with him. Yeah, I used to go. I went to church, claimed he knew the Lord, but he said, this hadn't gone lately. He said, I raised my kids in church, and none of them go now. And so I had a little conversation with that guy about what he could do now to get back with the Lord if he really knew him. And, you know, I find that it's easy to talk with people by just asking them a question. And you can find ways to begin conversations with people. People that you know at work, you know, maybe here's somebody you work by with and said, you know, Jim, we've worked together now for about three years. I really appreciate you. And I just, could I just ask you a question? And you ask him, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, I've told people for years, you can witness any day of the week that you're willing to buy a man his lunch. You can say, could I just take you to lunch? I want to talk with you. Well, he may be thinking you're going to sell him Amway or something. No, but there's something important. Let's don't talk about it till we get there because it's something I want to talk with you about. And you begin to ask him about his relationship with the Lord. You know, I just see the number of people right here tonight. If each one of us, and you know, God is amazing. He's made us different forms, different abilities, different jobs, different, and put us in different neighborhoods, and every one of us have contact with people. And if we would use those contacts literally as a result of the people in this room, hundreds of people could hear the Lord, hear of the Lord, <clears throat> even in one week's time, if you just took advantage of every opportunity you have. You go into a restaurant. Many times we said, waitress will come. Well, we're going to pray for a meal. Is there anything we can pray for you? And sometimes we can find out where they stand, or we can share a track with them, or we can witness to them. But think of the ways that you can witness and just show an interest. Now, I know you're afraid, 
The Lord's not giving you that spirit of fear. That comes from Satan. And he's got Christians all over scared. And I mean, if people even frown at us, we think, oh, wow. Well, well, these people got beat. And they went away rejoicing. They had some convictions. You know, you say to a person today, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm an engineer. <clears throat> or I'm a school teacher. <clears throat> When you think of Peter, do you think of fish? When you think of Barnabas, do you think of real estate? See, Peter was a fisherman, but when I don't think of, when I think of Peter today, his primary deal wasn't his profession. His primary deal was his witness of Jesus Christ. I don't know what Barnabas had. He just said he had some land and sold it. Maybe he just had a farm or maybe in real estate. I don't know. I just know he had some. But when I think of Barnabas, I don't think of land. But most of us were thought of by our profession. Oh, he's a teacher. He's an engineer. But we don't think he is a believer. He is a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to challenge you. <clears throat> you can be a witness you might say, well, I don't have the gift of gab. You don't have to have the gift of gab. Well, I'm very timid. I know a man that he was so timid. He would not even come to Sunday school because he's so embarrassed. But his wife came. And she, <clears throat> and she was in a Sunday school class with a man by the name of Gene Moore. And Gene was a businessman. He owned a couple of lumber yards. He built houses. And so he asked this lady... Uh, she said, I wish my husband would come to church, but he's so shy. So Jean goes to visit him and said, would you come to my Sunday school class and just keep records of who's there? And so that way he wouldn't have to, you know, he could be over in the corner kind of doing his thing. And so Jean said to him one day, he said, you know, on Wednesday night, let's come up here and, and eat and then let's go visit some people for our class. Would you go with me? Well, well uh, I don't know what to say. You don't say anything. You just go with me. For nine months on Wednesday night, he took him with him. I knew that man later. At first, he was the kind of guy you walk up and say something to him, and he'd just look down at his shoes. He was so shy. I don't know of anyone I've ever met that was more shy than that guy. But after Gene Moore took took him on Wednesday night to witness with him for nine months, just going out and visiting, witnessing the people. He later, when he retired, moved down along the border. He and his wife got a trailer and just to go witness the people. He led hundreds of people to the Lord before he died because he was a tremendous witness. Now, I know we all have different personalities. Some of it is harder for you than others. But you can, you can be gracious and ask a person about their relationship to the Lord. Do you know you have the same Holy Spirit living in you that these Christians had? It's the same God. He will empower you. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered. It's God that gives the increase. So neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters. It's God that gives the increase, and God loves to take weak people. And Paul said, you know, one time he had a thorn in the flesh. I don't know what that thorn in the flesh is, but I know one thing about thorns. They hurt. And three times he asked God to remove it, and God didn't. And I'm glad because he later told us why. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And one of the things I've told the Lord many times, Lord, the one thing I have to offer you in great abundance is weakness. And God loves to wo work through weak people. And it says in Galatians 6, 3, if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And we know that the power comes from God. You don't have to feel powerful. The power's in the gospel. 
And so you go in your weak conditions, and God, you know I need your help. You know I'm afraid. But Father, would you use me to witness to other people? And it may be that you simply plant a seed. You may never know how that, that seed later germinates. I've met people, and they say, well, I was, at, I was at OU when you were there. I didn't know you. I didn't come to BSU, but some of the guys in my dorm, and they'd knock on my door. They kept trying to get me to come to a Bible study, and somebody witnessed to me. I wasn't interested, but I never forgot it. And here they are 15 years later, and now they're a Sunday school teacher in a church because now they finally came to know Christ. And so my job is I go out and I, I witness, and maybe I find the guy's a Christian, okay? Are you living for the Lord? Are you witnessing to others? And so everybody we meet, we have an opportunity to have a witness in their life. So I want to challenge you. Come, come to some conviction. People really will go to hell, and there are people all around, and you might be the one that makes a difference. And people that Jesus Christ died for and loves and would come to know him if somebody prayed for them. And so you pray, and there's some people that you'll pray for for a long time, there's some people you may meet. You may be on an airplane. You talk to the person. You may never know what happens. But our job is to share the message, and we need to be doing that. Now, let me pray for you. <clears throat> Father, <clears throat> thank you. You tell us in your word that you have committed to us. You say this in 2 Corinthians 5. You have committed to us a word of reconciliation. Now then, we're ambassadors for Christ as though God were beseeching you through us. We beg you in Christ's name to come to Christ. And so, Father, you have committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. If we don't share the message they may never hear it. And Father, we know that what you decided before the foundation of the world was the how of salvation. It was going to be through your sending your son. But the who of salvation depends on who will accept him and yield their life to him. So John, Lord, we pray that we will plead with people, beg people, in Christ's name, to be reconciled to God. Father, would you use us to be witnesses? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me share one thing with you. <clears throat> Get some tracks. Some people say, well, I don't think tracks are effective. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> they are with some people. I've read stories of people. I get off an airplane in Helsinki in Finland. And I met by a professional hockey player. And he said, I came to know Christ when I read your little booklet that was translated into Finnish, The Real Purpose of Life. And sometimes, maybe all you can do. And one of the ways, and I learned this from one of our former students, the way he gives out a track, he said, instead of saying, here's something you ought to read, he just hands it to him and said, let me share with you a little booklet. And it was a message in this booklet to change my life. Now, the booklet didn't change your life, but the message in it was that you heard about Jesus, right? And so he does it that way. Let me just share with you. I pulled through to get something at a window, you know. Let's go get a, root, a sandwich. So we pull, you know, drive through, get a thing. I can hand that to him. Let me share a little booklet with you. I hope you'll read the message in this little booklet changed my life. Keep, and I have found, keep Spanish tracks. I get little Billy Graham, it's Spanish on one side, English on the other. <clears throat> we had a hailstorm in our area, and every house in our neighborhood had to have a new roof. 
You know who's on those roofs? Only one that you can get to work when it's 100 degrees in the summer in Oklahoma. It's the Spanish-speaking people. So we get the idea, why don't we just talk to my wife about, why don't we get some granola bars and let's get some little bags and let's put a granola bar and a track in it. And so we go by and this guy, a part we get tension, how many on your team? Well, nine, okay. Here's nine granola bars and little tracks. We've given out hundreds of these. I don't know what happens, but we pray God will use it. And a lot of times a track, a guy may take it home, lay it on a desk, and then later come. After I wrote this little track, <clears throat> back when I was 30 years old, a lady at the Baptist building said, do you ever want to get, be encouraged? Come up here someday and spend a half a day reading letters from people who've accepted the Lord as a result of reading this track. One guy finds it in the bus station, becomes a Christian, goes home, leads his wife to the Lord, said our whole lives have been changed. He just read a track. Do any and every way you can to get the gospel out. Invite people to church. Do whatever you can but you witness to them out in the world where you live. And if you'll do that, God will use you in an amazing way. Okay? I'm through for now.